chapter 8, page 160 in the New Testament of Good News, reading from verse 4. Then we're going to turn from there to Acts 19 and from there to Hebrews 6. Acts 8. It's a fascinating situation. The ministers of the early church stayed in Jerusalem and the members were scattered everywhere and the result was there was a tremendous increase in ministry and evangelism. In other words, the early church found its principal method of evangelism in scattering believers and everywhere they went, they preached. The believers who were scattered went everywhere preaching the message. And Philip went to the principal city in Samaria and preached the Messiah to the people there. The crowds paid close attention to what Philip said as they listened to him and saw the miracles which he performed. Evil spirits came out from many people with a loud cry, and many paralyzed and lame people were healed. So there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon lived there who for some time had astounded the Samaritans with his magic. He claimed that he was someone great and everyone in the city from all classes of society paid close attention to him. He is that power of God known as the great power, they said. They paid this attention to him because for such a long time he had astonished them with his magic. But when they believed Philip's message about the good news of the kingdom of God and about Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself also believed. And after being baptized, he stayed close to Philip and was astounded when he saw the great wonders and miracles that were being performed. The apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had received the word of God. So they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for the believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit had not yet come down on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Simon saw that the Spirit had been given to the believers when the apostles placed their hands on them. So he offered money to Peter and John and said, Give this power to me too, so that anyone I place my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter answered him, May you and your money go to hell for thinking that you can buy God's gift with money. You have no part or share in our work because your heart is not right in God's sight. Repent then of this evil plan of yours and pray to the Lord that he will forgive you for thinking such a thing as this. For I see that you're full of bitter envy and are a prisoner of sin. Simon said to Peter and John, Please pray to the Lord for me so that none of these things you spoke of will happen to me. After they had given their testimony and proclaimed the Lord's message, Peter and John went back to Jerusalem. On their way they preached the good news in many villages of Samaria. Now turn over a few pages to 175, chapter 19. Here we have another unusual situation which raises many questions. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul travelled through the interior of the province and arrived in Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit, they answered. Well then, what kind of baptism did you receive? Paul asked. The baptism of John, they answered. Paul said the baptism of John was for those who turned from their sins. And he told the people of Israel to believe in the one who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. 
They spoke in strange tongues and also proclaimed God's message. They were about twelve men in all. And now we're going to turn a little further in the New Testament, page 275, chapter 6 of Paul's letter to the Hebrews, where he says this. Let us go forward then to mature teaching and leave behind us the first lessons of the Christian message. We should not lay again the foundation of turning away from useless works and believing in God, of the teaching about baptisms and the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Let us go forward, and this is what we will do, if God allows. Before we talk together, let's ask the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. <coughs> Father, for some of us, these passages are fresh material. We have not studied them deeply or thought deeply about them before tonight. Others of us have thought perhaps too much about them and found ourselves embroiled in doubts and difficulties, arguments with others and within ourselves. We therefore pray that the spirit of wisdom will be with us now. That as I seek to share what is on my heart, that I may be able by your power to do so in a way that will help everyone in this place to understand what you are seeking to say to us and give us listening ears and obedient hearts so that your word may be effective and we may know and do the truth. Remove from our minds any preconceived notions and help us to go forward and this we will do if God allows. For his name's sake. Amen. Whenever I take baptismal classes and prepare people for this holy moment of baptism, I find that I'm asked about two questions. They're the same question, but they're asked in two, it's asked in two forms. One, I'm asked about the laying on of hands. What do we believe about the laying on of hands? And the other question, or the other form of it, which relates to it is, how does confirmation relate to what we are doing tonight? So I'm going to try and take those two questions very honestly and tonight rather than seek to inspire your hearts though I hope there may be a touch of inspiration I want to instruct your minds from the word of God and from what understanding I've been able to glean from it what we believe about this matter of the laying on of hands not just with a view to settling questions but with a view to getting more deeply into the will of God, all of us could I ask straight away, and I hope you won't feel embarrassed with this, how many, many of you have been prayed for with the laying on of hands for any purpose whatsoever? Now that is a surprising response. I think it is probably just the majority. Could you put your hands down? I may ask you later uh, for what particular reason it was, but for the moment let's note that probably coming up to half of you have already been prayed for in this manner. Why? Is it important? What does it mean? Let me begin with the hand of God. The Bible that I have has no hesitation about speaking about God's eyes, God's ears, God's nose and nostrils, God's mouth, God's face, God's shoulder, God's arms, God's hands, God's heart, God's bowels, God's legs, God's feet, even God's fingers. It's a strange way to talk about God when we know perfectly well God has no body at all. He is spirit and he has no physical flesh. So why does the Bible talk in this way? The answer is quite simple. It is not because God is like us, but it is because we are like him. 
and that the things we do with our physical organs and members, he is able to do without those organs and members, and he is able to do even more. In other words, everything I can do with my hand, he can do, and more. Everything I can do with my feet, he can do, and more. Everything I can do with my mouth, he can do, and more. And therefore, God is at least able to do everything I can do with my hand or with my face, and more. Now, I want to start there, because the point of laying on hands in prayer is related to the hands of God. What I want to say is this, that unless the hand of God is in the hand of men in such an act, then it is merely a ceremony without any point. Now, the hand of God is talked of in two ways in Scripture. On the one hand, there is the obvious way of talking of his hands in relation to his handiwork. When I was just preparing this, I, I wrote a few things down and then I, I didn't like what I'd written. This often happens, but it doesn't get as far as you usually. And I just crumbled it into a ball and threw it across the room into the waste paper basket. Most times I get it in. <laughs> and uh, it just immediately struck me. I just felt like God rubbing together Jupiter or Venus and flinging it into orbit. Realized that making stars was one of God's hobbies. And he just likes making stars. When I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars, the work of your hands, the work of your fingers, and I'm one of his handicrafts. I'm the work of his hands. And those trees I can see out of my window when I study, those are his handiwork. Now that's one way of talking about the hands of God. But there is clearly another way of talking in the scripture about the hand of God. A much stronger, deeper, more spiritual way. On the one hand, there are phrases like the hand of God was upon Gideon or Elijah or someone else. And it means that somehow that man was so strong because God's hand was upon him that he could do things with his own hands that otherwise he'd never have been able to do. To have the hand of God upon you is to have a strength that is not your own. Then there are other phrases at the opposite end which say the hand of God was against the Philistines. And that means, quite frankly, you can fight as hard as you like, you'll get nowhere. This applies to every part of life. If the hand of God is upon you, you will achieve more than you dreamt possible. But if the hand of God is against you, you'll fight and you'll push and you'll get nowhere. That's not just true of Christian service. It's true of the whole of life. If the hand of God is upon your life at the end of it, you'll have so much to show for it. But if the hand of God is against you, you'll get to your grave with nothing. However many things you may have done, you will achieve nothing. Now, I'm going to turn from that background now to the use of the human hand and try and link them up, because unless we see that there must be a link between the hand of God and the hands of men if we're going to lay hands on each other, we will miss the meaning of the scriptural teaching. Look at these hands of mine. I use them largely for three purposes. The first is physical, and I remember reading a Reader's Digest article, I think, I am John's hand. Do you know that series? I am John's this, I am John's that, I am John's big toenail, and you learn all about your big toenail. But I remember this being said about I am John's hand, that the hand is the most complicated mechanism in the whole human body. There are other more complicated phys uh, chemical reactions, but physically, mechanically, that hand is the most complicated part of my body and is able to do the most incredible things. I was talking to a man earlier today whom I baptized about 16 years ago. It was quite a baptism because he told me that he had been born with internal deformities and that he had a very weak heart and that he couldn't climb steps, he had to live in a bungalow, that he couldn't take a hot bath. And how was he going to manage because the Lord was telling him to be baptized? Well, I said, first go and see your doctor, which he did. And his doctor said, if God is telling you to, go ahead. God will look after you. And I was so glad to have the doctor say that to him. 
But I remember taking Alan down the steps into the water, bringing him up out, and he climbed up out dripping wet, and he never had a tremor. Not a tremor. And when I saw him today, retired 16 years later, I said, Alan, you're looking better than ever. And he was. Looking far better than when I baptized him. It's good for you, you know. And he was looking far better. I said, Alan, what are you doing now? that you retired. What are you finding to do? He was one of those involved in developing Technicolor film in uh, the 1930s. But I said, what are you doing now? He said, I'm making violins. And I just know, knowing that man and how particular and precise he is with his scientific training, he's made one and he's on his way to completing a second. And I just know those will be wonderful violins. Some of us had the privilege of watching Arthur Rubenstein play for us in Jerusalem at the age of 94. And those fingers, he left the piano stool and he ran up and down the keyboard, remember? And the place just rose to its feet in a standing ovation that the hands of man can do such things. Even typing is beyond me, except for this. <laughs> and when I do this, I then have to do that. <laughs> Those of you type will know what that is. But to think that we can do so much. Look at a surgeon's hands. We can make things. We can manipulate things. My son yesterday started a jigsaw of the cockpit of Concord. It is the most dreadful jigsaw you've seen. <laughs> Dials, switches, buttons. It's nothing else. It's a horrible one. But right in the middle is a thing like a pair of handlebars. And on those two bars I know rest two hands and over a hundred lives and uh, many millions of pounds worth of machinery are in two hands of men. And those hands will bring that thing down to land. Yes, they're amazing hands. They can do evil things as well as good things. They can steal and they can murder. But they are God's instruments given to me and the loss of a hand is a very serious thing. I was dreadfully shocked when I first personally encountered that barbaric punishment in Arabia for stealing. If a man is caught stealing in the marketplace, his hand is severed there and then, and he loses that most vital part of his body. That is why stealing is comparatively rare. There is only one rather unusual crime in the Old Testament for which that dreadful punishment is prescribed by God. That's the physical use of my hand. But you know perfectly well that I don't just use these hands for physical reasons. I use them a great deal for social reasons. One, two, three. Thank you. It's nice when there's some kind of response. But you see, you realize what I was doing. I wasn't making anything. I wasn't manipulating anything. Not really. But I got a wave back. And, and I linked with a few of you. That's a social thing. Or I remember having to learn how to do that <laughs> and salute. And that was an acceptance of my role in relation to somebody else's. And there are many such gestures. In fact, there's a whole craze now of books on body language. And I'm sure you've been reading some of them. But all of you use your hands to do this. When you want somebody to come, you do this. When you want somebody to get out of the room, you do that. And all through these wonderful things we call hands. Now, so far, I've been describing the social use without touching, though it's intriguing. One theory is that when I wave to somebody, I'm stroking them at a distance. That's intriguing. I'm patting them at a distance. And we British tend to be those who extend the hand of fellowship and keep people at, keep people at arm's length. That is the society in which we're brought up. And yet there are the uses of hands in touch which express profound social relationships. At the very least, a warm handshake, or a double handshake, or a grip of the arm and a handshake, or an embrace, or a firm grip of someone who's in fear and who needs to take a grip of themselves. How often just taking a grip of them helps them to take a grip of themselves? And all of you as children, I hope, have had the experience of hands laid on you for good and perhaps for not so good, for chastening 
is not pleasant at the time, but afterwards it yields peaceable fruit. So we've all had hands laid on us in one form or another. And indeed we are discovering increasingly how deprived a person can be who has not been touched enough by other people. And the average British use of the word touching is that we've had a touching experience. We mean nobody did touch me, but uh, inside I just felt something happen. More might have been felt if we had been touched. We can, of course, express profound disapproval with the hand. We can slap, we can punch, we can shove. But now let me move on to the third use of hands for which God intended them. And here I'm moving into an area which is embarrassing to British people and to a few others, the spiritual use of hands. Every song we're going to sing tonight and every hymn we've sung tonight and will sing tonight describes the spiritual ministry of hands. But it's a thing we've never been used to. And mostly the use of our hands in worship is to hold the hymn book. And you've been singing hearts and minds and hands and voices all unite, but your hands held the hymn book, I noticed. And you sang, we've come into his house, so forget about yourselves and concentrate on him. Let's lift up holy hands. And every hymn I've chosen, and I've found no difficulty in finding them, and every chorus we shall sing, unless we have a few more injected into the mix uh, spontaneously, will include this word hands. Now, it's interesting that when children are taught to say their prayers, they're taught to do that. Were you taught to do that? How many of you were told that that was the thing to do with your hands? That, again, is the large majority of you. I wonder where it came from. Have you ever wondered? I've never seen anything in the Bible about doing that. I've heard two theories. One is that that is the oriental gesture of respect and that that's where it came from. I've heard others say that it's an imitation of a gothic archway. <laughs> and Yes, quite seriously, I've heard that. And that you're kind of creating a little mini cathedral for yourself to get into. But what is clear is this, that the hands were used a great deal in the Bible for a spiritual purpose. They were clearly used in prayer, but never doing that. As far as I can read from every reference, the attitude of prayer was that. And when you see a newsreel film from Bangladesh of starving children, that gesture is understood as the most natural gesture of pleading, of asking for that which you haven't got, which you can only hope to receive because you don't have any right to receive. And that gesture seems the most natural. I know that many of you have found in private prayer that it is helpful not to do this, but just to do that and to go back to your childhood days. Mummy, mummy, daddy, daddy. And when you wanted something, that's what your hands did. And it expressed for you and often when you did that to your parents, who were so much bigger than you were, it came about the level of their hand and you found something in yours. That clearly is what is meant by lifting up hands, palms upwards, fingers forwards. That seems to be the gesture of prayer. But other natural gestures of children and even adults have crept in to Christian worship and even Jewish worship. Not just that, but here's another that clearly crept in, that. Now what are you thinking or feeling when you do that? <clears throat> Did you watch Twickenham yesterday? I didn't, but if we have any Welshmen here, I guess they did. And if you watch Twickenham, did they keep their hands in their pockets <laughs> when England got a few more points or when Wales pulled ahead? No. Their hands went up. <laughs> watch a footballer who scored a goal. What does he do? Put his hands in his pockets or say yes or say yes, thank you, congratulate <laughs> No, no, no. He's too excited for that. He's up that way. His palms are forwards. His fingers are up or even back. When you see something wonderful, don't you do this? And if you don't do that, or if you do do that, it very often resolves into that. 
and the very response of wonder and admiration and approval and response is to go like that. To pull their hands back and to draw them together. And again, as far as I can read into the Psalms and into other Old Testament scriptures, the people of God in ancient Israel who would naturally, when they saw something wonderful, just say, oh my, isn't that wonderful? When they went to worship God, they said, oh my, isn't he wonderful? And Psalm 47 just takes that up and says, clap your hands, all you people. Bring your hands together. My, they clapped and cheered yesterday at Twickenham, I, I guess. I should think you could hear them across the river at Richmond. And so the Old Testament is perfectly natural in doing this. But there is a profounder reason for using hands in spiritual ministry in the Old Testament. Not just to express spirituality by praying or praising in wonder, but there is also, and here we come to the most profound use of hands in spiritual ways, the use of hands to transfer spiritual reality from one life to another. You find this use right through the ancient scriptures. You find dear Jacob blessing his sons. And he blesses them through his hands. And he does that not just as a symbol. He knows that God made body and soul and that physical and spiritual are one in God's sight. The creator and the redeemer are one. And so he puts his hands on his sons. And he blesses them with his hands, through his hands. And believes that his hands at that moment are becoming the hands of God and that through his human hands the hand of God is touching that son for good. The same occurs when, for example, the Levites are set apart to be priests to God. Hands are laid on them, not just as a kind of badge of authority, but that God's hand through human hands may equip them and protect them for such a holy ministry. You get the same thing in an even more dramatic moment when once a year they took a poor old goat and one after another they came up and they laid their hands on that goat's head and they said, Lord, I've been guilty of envy of my neighbor. Lord, I've been guilty of being angry with my wife and children. And what were they doing? Through laying on of hands they were transferring their guilt to that poor old goat. Through physical contact, they were transmitting a spiritual reality. And then that poor old goat was pushed out of Jerusalem, out into the wilderness, there to die. Now, our basic understanding of this last use of hands in a spiritual ministry is distorted by two things. One, the fact that most of us were brought up and a, a system of education that owed much more to ancient Greece than to ancient Hebrew. And to the ancient Greeks, the body was one thing and the spirit was another. And in their thinking, the twain hardly ever met. And therefore, with that kind of a background which crept into our Western civilization, we ask, how can a physical thing produce spiritual results? How can being washed in physical water cleanse the conscience? How can eating physical bread and drinking physical wine allow me to feed and drink on Jesus spiritually? And we have this great gulf in our thinking between the physical and the spiritual. The Hebrew doesn't have that gulf. He didn't see them separate because he said, God made my hands and made the bread and made the wine and made the water and God can be in these things doing good for my spirit. There wasn't this gulf to cross. The other difficulty under which we British labor is the fact that in Britain we are not a touching people. We prefer telepathy to touch. We really do. Let me illustrate that. We hear of someone who's sick. What is our response spiritually? Is it not to get as many people praying telepathically about them as possible? Especially if they're seriously sick. Will you pray? Will you pray? Will you pray? Write to someone else. Will you pray? Will you pray? But the first instinct in the Bible would probably have been who is going to touch 
Not who is going to exercise telepathic prayer, but who's going to go and touch that sick person. And I don't think they would mind me sharing with you, it's not betraying confidence as I believe, when I say that the little uplifts that came to the elders as they met twice this week was that two of our number were just able to say, I touched and healing came. It was a real blessing to us. Not, I exercised telepathic prayer, but I touched. Now let's come to Jesus, because in Jesus we see all the answers to our questions. In Jesus we see the hand of God and the hand of man as the one and the same hand. You can't do anything else. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that when Jesus walked this earth, God was walking this earth, that in Jesus you could see God with a face, you could see not only God with a face, you could see God with hands. And I'm so glad that God with hands spent 18 years making tables and chairs and doors and window frames. And that he was a carpenter. And that he used his hands as I've used my hands, with tools. That he was a manual laborer and gave a dignity to manual labor, which we will lose as soon as we lose sight of Jesus as the carpenter of Nazareth. But he did not limit his hands to physical use. I'm sure that he used them socially to wave to people as they passed the door of the carpenter's shop, to shake hands with them when they came in, or to hug them in his family. But he used them for the power of God to reach people. Now, let me make it quite clear, there was nothing magic about Jesus' hands. The power lay in Jesus, but the hands were his. And those hands could take a few loaves and fishes, and as if they were the hand of God, and they were, create lots more bread and lots more fish until 5,000 people had enough to eat and still there was some left over. Those human hands were the hands of God creating, as God's hands can do, creating something out of nothing. Those hands could touch the stopped ears of the deaf. They could touch the blind eyes. Those hands were the hand of God and those hands could even raise the dead. A young girl lying on a bed, 12 years old, and Jesus could take that little girl's corpse by the hand and say, Talitha Kumi, get up! Come on, get up! And the hand of God was holding the hand of that little girl. I've often wondered what Jesus' hands looked like during his life. They must have been wonderful hands. Did they look like a surgeon's hands? No, I don't think so. They must have looked more like a carpenter's hands. I remember someone telling me that they had to undergo a very serious operation and they were recommended to a specialist in London whom they were told was the absolute expert in the field. And it was a man in Adelston who went. And he went to see this man and when he went in he got the shock of his life because when the surgeon brought his hands onto the desk they looked like gardener's hands. They were big, they were tough, they were calloused. They were strong. They weren't the kind of delicate hands that you expect in a surgeon. And I'm afraid he was a bit put off and he thought, well, that man looks as if he'll have a real time cutting me up and getting me together again with great hams like that and, and hands that really looked as if they'd been through a steel foundry for years. But then he put himself in that surgeon's hands and that surgeon performed the most delicate operation for which there wasn't a hundred percent chance that it was going to come off. And he came through it, and the operation was a success, and he got his health and his life back again. He said, you know, I praise those hands. I don't mind that those hands didn't look like the hands I thought they should. They were able to do what I needed. I don't know what Jesus' earthly hands looked like. I just know that once those hands touched people, the hand of God was upon them. And even little children were brought to him and it said he took them in his arms and he put his hands on them and blessed them. He didn't just say bless you. He put his hands on them and blessed them. And I guess they never forgot that touch. And then they took those beautiful hands. I say beautiful not because they look beautiful, but because they did beautiful things for God. And they took those hands and they mutilated them. And they are mutilated tonight. And when you see them, you will see mutilated hands. And they were mutilated by cruel men. 
but those hands were the hand of God. If Jesus was the Word made flesh, those very hands of his were the hand of God. And I would think you would have no difficulty in understanding the laying on of hands if Jesus stood here tonight physically with his risen, ascended body, if he returned tonight and stood in this building, even though his hands were mutilated, he said, which of you wants me to touch you? You would cue down those aisles to be touched. And you would have no difficulty in believing that the hand of God was upon you if he touched you. Now, when I read the rest of the New Testament, I find this lovely truth comes through that those filled with the Spirit of Jesus believe that their hands were the hands of Jesus and therefore the hand of God. It's an amazing act of faith on the part of the early church. But they went around using those hands. The apostles used them in such a way that people marveled at what was done through their hands. And it was so often the hands of the apostles that got the public attention rather than their heads or their mouths. It was what they did with their hands that first made people think again about these illiterate fishermen. Their hands. And it wasn't just apostles. Elders in the church did this. And ordinary Christians did this. Believers prayed with their hands. Not like this, or even like this, but like that, on people. If you want an example of an ordinary believer who did this, three days after Saul of Tarsus met the risen Jesus and had been physically blinded, his retinas had been just scarred by the brilliance of the glory of Jesus. Three days later, a dear old man called Ananias, who wasn't an apostle, and as far as I know held no particular office in the church, Ananias came and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me to lay hands on you and to pray that you may be able to see again and that you may be baptized and that you may wash your sins away. And I just imagine the scene in the street called Straight where this dear old man put his hands on one he had feared a few days before, one who'd come to throw him into prison if he could, and he laid his hand on him. How like Jesus, who would even touch a leper. Now they laid their hands on people in the early church, sometimes for healing, as in the case of Ananias and Saul and others. They laid their hands on people when they were called to a particular task, not as a recognition that they were now in authority, but for the equipment for that task. Because Paul says to Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands. Something was imparted, something came to you from God through the hands that were on you. That is the dynamic notion of laying on of hands. It is not a ceremony, it is not a symbol, it is not a rite. It is done in a dynamic way that something may be imparted by God to those who are being touched. And that those human hands become in that moment, through prayer, of righteous men, the hand of God. I must therefore now come to this matter of Christian initiation. I mean by that, how does one enter the Christian life fully, so that one is firing on all four cylinders? Well, the answer of the scripture is very simple there are four things necessary to get going in the Christian life. Number one, that you repent. And I notice it says repent from dead or useless works. And that means not only turning my back on the bad things I've done, but also, and this is what many people don't understand, turning my back on the good things I've done, because they are just as dead and useless. That's a concept of repentance which many people don't understand. All right, if I've been a bad lad, if I've done things wrong, I can understand that repentance means turning away from that. But what about the good things I've done? What about when I've been kind to my neighbor and helped granny? What about all that? Repentance is turning away even from that and saying, as Paul said, even my righteousness is rubbish. 
Even the good things I've done have not helped to make me what God wants me to be. I need grace and grace alone. That's repentance and it's the first of the four fundamental things we need. The second is to believe, which doesn't mean to be able to say the creed and accept every statement in it because the devil can recite the Apostles' Creed. The devil agrees with all that. He trembles at it. To believe is to rely on those facts, to trust in that person. The third thing that is necessary to entering fully into the Christian walk is to be baptized in water, and this we are going to witness tonight. But I read for you two distinct, clear passages in which a group of people had received all those three steps of initiation, had entered into all three experiences of repenting, believing, and being baptized, but in those two cases, quite clearly, there was still something yet to enjoy. And that was sought through prayer. And it was sought through a particular form of prayer, prayer through the laying on of hands, a very personal, powerful, direct prayer, believing that through the hands of men, the hand of God can convey what is lacking. Now here we come right to the point where we have to face a rather difficult question. And it's this. Does this mean that every Christian should go through a prayer with the laying on of hands in order to be complete in all that they should experience to start the Christian life? My answer from the book of Acts would be no. For many came into that fourth dimension of knowing and enjoying consciously the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit without anyone laying hands on them. In Acts 2, nobody was laying on hands. In Acts 10, Peter couldn't get his sermon finished before Cornelius was off. Notice he still added water baptism because the important thing is to get all that God has for you. But there are cases in the New Testament, quite a number, where people have come into the fourth dimension of the Holy Spirit's conscious presence in power and in release and freedom without the laying on of hands. And so if I only had the book of Acts to go on, then I would say that it seems to be that in cases where people did not spontaneously or readily receive a conscious experience of the power of the Holy Spirit, then the way that that was put right was through prayer, with the laying on of hands, and that that was the appropriate method of doing so. But, and here I come to the but, and I will face it as honestly as I can. In Hebrews 6, the writer lists six fundamental things and calls them these are the first lessons in the Christian life. Repentance, repentance, belief in God, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection, judgment. And in that passage it looks very clearly as if the laying on of hands is a fundamental first lesson for every Christian. And out of that has grown a practice which you know in other fellowships as confirmation. The ceremony of, or the rite of confirmation is quite clear in its intention. It is not a substitute for baptism and never was intended to be that. It is, if you read the wording used on such occasions, a prayer with the laying on of hands that that person may receive all that God has for them and may be conscious that the Holy Spirit is powerfully present in their life to deal with every need they have. That indeed is why the person who does the act sometimes wears a symbolic flame upon his head with two tips to the flame. But the shape of the mitre is the shape of the flames on the heads at Pentecost. Now, I'd like to make a confession here that maybe we have overreacted to the formality that confirmation can and has become. 
Alas, most of us go through a religious idealistic period between about 11 and 14 years of age. Whether that religious idealism is simply part of teenage dreaming and the hopes to make the most of life, which is perfectly valid, or whether it is the work of God that will last and come through to a mature faith, only time will tell. But when I face the fact that 26% of the British population have had laid hands laid on them with prayer for the release of the Holy Spirit, I am to say the least disturbed at the lack of results from that. And that makes me, I'm afraid, overreact to the laying on of hands. And I think God wants us to get this balanced up. And I think he wants those of us who have overreacted into doing it too little to catch up. And those who are doing it too much and too easily to realize what they are doing. And really to believe that the hands of men can become the hand of God in prayer. And so I want to suggest two practical ways in which we as a fellowship, I believe, are being called to move forward. I have noticed that over the last few years, the Lord has gently and quietly and in his loving, patient way, and how patient the Lord is, he has led us to be a more touching people. Thank God for that. I don't think anybody has felt threatened by that. I hope they haven't. Perhaps I know of one or two who felt it a bit strange. But he has led us to do this, and I've noticed it in the foyer. And I'm glad about that. The more naturally we use our hands for all the purposes which God intended, the more naturally we can use them towards each other, and vice versa. The more naturally we can grip a brother's arm to firm up his faith, the more natural it is to pray for him with our hands as well as with our words. And so, first of all, in general terms, I think the Lord is calling us to learn to use our hands more than just to hold our hymn book and push our spectacles back on our nose in church. But not to do it under a sense of constraint or legalism, thou shalt get thy, thy hands up this far, if not this far, if not this far. But in the sense of freedom, that God literally would love you to do what you sang in that first hymn and what you're going to sing in the last hymn. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what you can do in that last hymn. You can miss out the word hands. <laughs> or else you can just use one of your free hands and, and say with hearts and hands and voices. Just use it naturally to God. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. Chorus after chorus, hymn after hymn. We're going to sing in a moment, Take my life and let it be. And in the second verse we shall sing, Take my hands. Do you mean that? Are you just thinking of the pen pushing at the office or digging the neighbor's garden or helping out with wallpapering? Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of your love. Not of my love, but of yours. Let them move. If your love is telling them to move, let them move. And if your love is telling me to go and lay hands on someone, then, then here are my hands. Let them move at the impulse of your love. That's a general thing. It's a thing that has to grow within a fellowship. Unless the natural use of the hands grows in worship and in social relationships, then a confirmation right becomes a formality unrelated to reality. It's a religious thing, divorced from a natural use of the hand. And that, I think, is when it runs into danger. But when people are used to receiving comfort from others through the hands, and when they are used to worshipping God with their hands, it seems the most natural thing in the world to say, I'd like to pray for you, and I want you to feel my prayer physically as well as spiritually. Which brings me to the final point, the practical point, which is a, a specific one. We're going to exercise it tonight. We've 
talked it over with the candidates, and we're going to do it for their sakes as well as ours, uh, just as an act of Christian love. And that is to recognize the inadequacy of baptism to do all that we need to do, done for us. Baptism essentially deals with our past. It buries the past. It's, it's the cut-off point from the past. People had been following Moses all the way to the Red Sea, but then they were baptized into Moses, and it was cut-off point for old Pharaoh. From then on, Moses had them all to himself. And those who are being baptized tonight have been following Jesus up to this point, but this baptism is cut off point and we tell the devil so. They're buried and beyond your reach. We call your bluff. This is cut off point. This is a bath to wash away the past. It's references to the past. And sometimes we come to baptism hoping that baptism will do everything we need in the future. That once I'm baptized, I'll be a powerful witness. That once I'm baptized, I, I shall be able to walk in God's ways. Once I'm baptized, that's it. Look, just let me put a cautionary word in. Baptism will bury the past. Baptism will wash you through and through and give you a clean conscience. But all that's dealing with your past. Let's recognize that candidates need help for the future and need more than a past dealing with. Jesus had a pretty severe little parable about spring cleaning a house and leaving it all clean and empty and not putting anything in, in place of what had been washed away and cleaned out. And so these candidates need prayer. They need your prayer tonight, this week, as the devil seeks to rob them of what God will give them in their baptism. And so we're going to have at the end of the service, not in the service, but I'm mentioning it for your prayer and for your cooperation if you feel led, the end of the service, at the beginning of the last hymn, the candidates and their friends will be going the beginning of the hymn out of that far door and straight up to the upper room. And we invite to come with them any close friends, relatives who wish to be there, and any of you who have known them in your house group, or in your area, and who would wish to pray for them for the future, and wish to minister to them for the future. They've got a clean sheet before them, and we want written on that sheet what God wants to write. And we invite you, if you feel that the Spirit is saying, yes, I could minister to these candidates up there in a small meeting which will not take long, and we shall just gather there, and we'll just praise God, and then we'll pray for those who've been baptized and we shall pray with our hands so that they may feel the touch of God upon them. I hope that that has helped to clarify your th thinking and helped you to understand why we can present our bodies as an act of spiritual worship and say, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of your love. O oh, strengthen me that while I stand firm on the rock and strong in thee, I may stretch out a loving hand to restless with the troubled sea. Let's pray. Father, as we move now into the baptisms, we ask, that you will keep your word with each of these candidates and that you will bury the past beyond all recall, that you will wash them from head to toe, that they may never feel so clean as they will after their baptism. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to struggle for years to get clean. It is your intention to give us a bath early on that we might be washed. Lord, they've already followed you. They've already put their trust in you. Now we ask you to wash them in the water before us. And then, Lord, we shall pray for them. And seek that your hand may be upon them for good, so that they may find themselves strong in the Lord and able to do things that they never dreamt possible. We ask it in the name of the one whose hands are still pierced, but who holds them up in prayer to your throne, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.